The first time I heard about the Roosevelt Hotel was when my friend Marley told me about it. Marley was one of the most beautiful boys I'd ever seen, with golden curls and a face that stopped people on the street. It's a classic Hollywood haunt. They have a hidden bar full of games and things, but in this old Hollywood way. It has two lanes for bowling, so it looks vaguely like a classic bowling alley, only darker and smokier, like it's haunted, like a 1920s speakeasy. They get the wood and everything for the lane stripped from some place in El Paso and shipped over, Italian leather everywhere. It sounded like a place for retiring mobsters, well-dressed socialites, and other people who wanted to be let in on a secret. Marley was an actor slash model and worked at the hotel bar between gigs. His job was to oil the two bowling lanes and treat the groups that came to their experience. He wore suspenders. He was the bowling guy, but he wore suspenders. It was that kind of place. The Roosevelt opened in 1927 and was the oldest continually operating hotel in Los Angeles. It was known for being haunted by Marilyn Monroe and for an iconic old Hollywood style pool. It was a swanky joint. I immediately wanted to go. I'm a sucker for speakeasies and old timey shit. I've always loved the idea of a bookshelf sliding open and there's a whole world behind it. But it was... <laughs> But it was COVID, so I waited, and then I forgot about it. <laughs> Over a year later, my husband and I are living happily in San Diego, but unhappily together. We'd been married four years, and we'd never quite figured out how to do so smoothly. And that summer had tested us. He was my favorite person in the world, and yet I kept suggesting we get divorced. I needed to go to Los Angeles for work and was looking up hotels. And there it was, the Hollywood Roosevelt. Yahtzee. <laughs> I booked a stay. I figured a night in a beautiful hotel in Hollywood could be the perfect way to remind us how in love we still were. After a few years of marriage, I was frustrated with his complacency. He didn't plan adventures for us. He didn't make dinner reservations. I felt sometimes like he was just a plus one to my life. And here I was again, making reservations for us, trying to sweep us off our collective feet. We'd both been dreamers when we first met in college. Now that we were married with stable jobs and a house, he felt like his dreams had come true. But I was still dreaming. I kept a 30 before 30 list of 30 big adventures to go on that decade. He encouraged me to check the items off my list, just not with him. I wanted to go to law school and fight for justice. He was supportive, but was also ready to start our family yesterday. He was content to do nothing, and I felt restless. I felt like he was waiting for me to get tired and just take it easy with him. I alternated either feeling resentful when I would take it easy, or feeling guilty when I wouldn't. Still, we loved each other so much that we could never take the next step on divorce. And I was afraid of being alone. I loved his company. He was my best friend. We'd gone to college together, where we'd been in the same club, and then we graduated and got the same job. We moved around the country together. We had built a community together. He understood me so deeply. And he did the laundry and made sure I ate dinner. <laughs> he listened to my ideas and challenged me. He made traveling feel safer. He made me laugh. I desperately hoped he could join me. But all he could say was, maybe I'll meet you there in a few days. I was not stoked on the idea of going on a trip all by myself. What's the point of getting a sick hotel room if you have no one to share it with? But then I got to the hotel. The Hollywood Roosevelt was perfect without him. <laughs> it was elegant and old school, artisanal, but also classic vintage. It was like if a dirty martini or an old-fashioned cocktail was turned into a hotel. It was beauty. It was grace. It was Miss United States. It was the ghost of Marilyn Monroe singing Happy Birthday, Mr. President. I felt like a motherfucking badass when I checked in. 
this was my Home Alone 2 Lost in New York moment. I was about to ball out. No parents, no rules. I could jump on the bed, order whatever on room service. I didn't do that, of course. I was afraid to even touch anything in the minibar for fear that I'd get charged, but <laughs> I was stoked to see there were complimentary slippers. <laughs> I had been afraid to feel lonely at the hotel, like when Home Alone ends up being just Kevin walking around sad, missing his mama. I had been in a rut for a while. My day job had been crushing me, and with the weight of marriage troubles, I had become a small, smushed version of myself. I slipped my feet into the complimentary slippers, and I dipped a toe into the unexpected luxury of being alone. I spent my entire first day at the pool, LSAT prep in front of me. As I did logical reasoning problems, I told the pool boy to keep the glasses of champagne coming. Just kidding, again, I ordered water. I was studying for the LSAT. <laughs> um, <laughs> but with every fiber of my being, I tried to radiate an essence of someone very cool and sure of herself. And in a way that I hadn't in a long time, even though I was alone, I felt very cool and sure of myself. I felt independent and free. I was crushing LSAT problems. I was making decisions for me. I was living my own life. I called my sister and told her how happy I was feeling, how I hadn't felt so happy in a while, that I felt like I could breathe. In the end, I told my husband not to come. And when I got back home, we both could tell something big had shifted. With heavy hearts, we knew we were ready to take the next step. I told him I thought it was time that one of us moved out. He did by the end of the month. I was really home alone now. It took me a while to want to adventure. After we separated, I hibernated for a while, but it had been on my 30 before 30 list to go visit Falling Water, an architectural feat of Frank Lloyd Wright nestled in the woods an hour and a half outside of Pittsburgh. And I was now 29. My husband had never been enthusiastic about the idea, but I couldn't convince any of my friends to go either. I always hoped I would find a new friend who was as excited about architecture or that my husband would one day indulge me, but the years ticked by and I still had not made it there. So a year after he moved out, I finally thought, fuck it, I'll take myself. After all, I had stayed alone at the Hollywood Roosevelt. I had a proof of concept that I could entertain myself for a weekend, that I could enjoy something even if I wasn't sharing it with someone else, that a solo vacation was not a sad concept but an exciting prospect. As I planned my architectural tour of Western Pennsylvania, I discovered the incredible possibilities available now that I didn't have to factor anyone else into my calculations. Autumn seemed like a nice time to go to Pennsylvania to catch the foliage, so I decided to go in October. I didn't have to worry about what worked with both our schedules. Besides, when I go somewhere I've never been before, I really try to maximize my time and do the most things. For years, that meant exhausting my travel companion, which often resulted in me simplifying the itinerary from what I initially hoped to do. Now, I could make choices I wouldn't make if I were considering someone else's comfort. So the day of the trip, as soon as my evening criminal law class got out, I took the Thursday red eye to Pittsburgh with a 5 a.m. layover in Detroit so I could get an early start exploring Pittsburgh on Friday. A nightmare to some. <laughs> but I could handle it. <laughs> and instead of just seeing falling water, I squeezed in a visit to three other Frank Lloyd Wright houses too, and another house designed by his understudy, as well as the Carnegie Museum of Art and the Warhol Museum. And instead of finding somewhere to stay suitable for two, I packed a tent and a sleeping bag and camped by myself. I, f I found a campsite 30 minutes from falling water that looked like there was a lake nearby and booked the site nearest the lake. I had plane tickets, I had reservations to the museums. I didn't just plan to visit Falling Water either, I got a full tour of the estate and a forest to table dinner inside the house. I was on a romantic vacation for one. <laughs> when I arrived for the dinner, I was the only single. Everyone there was in a couple. Some were on honeymoons, others on their anniversary. There were about eight couples, all very much in love, and then there was me. 
We dined at a long table together. I thought to myself, I sweep myself off my feet. <laughs> I felt very cool and very sure of myself. When the dinner was over, I drove back to my campground. When I had checked into the campsite, the park ranger said, your tent camping? But it's so cold. It turned out I was the only person who had booked a tent site. Everyone else was staying in cabins or RVs. It was October in Pittsburgh. My husband and I used to love to go camping together and he had always made sure I was warm. But I was prepared. I gathered firewood and pitched my tent right next to the designated campfire area. When I got back from dinner, I made a quick fire, got in sweats, brushed my teeth, and crawled into my sleeping bag. With the tent unzipped from where I lay, I watched as the flames danced, illuminating ever so slightly the woods behind them, the moon hanging just above the treetops. It was no Hollywood Roosevelt, but I fell asleep warm. Thank you, Julie Rollins.